Hi, my name is Ben, and in this video we'll be looking at net running and net runners in the Subhunk Red Core system for Foundry Virtual Tabletop. Now, as of August 2021, I've tried to make sure this video is as accurate as possible, um, but please do check the system change log for any updates that may have uh, changed any of these settings or anything that you need to, to keep in mind. Now, before we dive too far into this, I did want to cover that Altos Arena Games does have a restriction in place at the moment on what we're able to provide to you out of the box. So we're not able to ship to you Black Ice uh, programs or the applicable actor types that are used within Foundry. Creating actors and programs are quite straightforward. I'll just quickly show you an example of how they might look. So you can see here that I've created both an Asp and a Hellhound actor, and this is under the Actors Directory tab. And if we look at one of the actors I've created, I've just imported in to the character, the applicable stats from their uh, from their character sheet, um, as well as their effects, and you know if there's any notes that you want to add as well. You'll actually see that we have within the system is a collection of uh, sort of images that you're able to use. So this is within the system directory. So definitely, if you want to just add a little bit of emphasis, you can definitely check that out. Uh, now programs as well, there are a very similar thing. We go to the items directory under create item. There's going to be a black ice. Uh, sorry, there's a program uh, type here. And similar to that, once we've actually got the program in place, I'll just take a look at the ASP, for example. Under the settings, we can see here that there's a class of black ice. And then from here, we can actually set the black ice type, damage to net runner, and then all the applicable stats as well. And this will come into play a little bit later as we go through the next section. Now, for anyone to actually accomplish a net run, there's one thing that we need, which is a cyber deck. So what we'll do is let's bring up in our compendium, which is just here under compendium packs, let's bring up the gear folder. And then we'll actually see that we have a cyber deck that we're able to use for this example for our character, whose name is Case. So we bring up their character sheet, move him over to the right. You can see here we have our cyber deck on the left. We'll drag this one just across, just like this. And we can see that he now has a cyber deck there with seven applicable slots. What we'll also do for him is we'll actually bring in some programs because we'll be installing that onto the cyber deck as well. So let's close this, move him over just a little bit, bring up the programs and we'll do a similar thing as well. And let's say that we want shield, say that we want sword, and what else? Maybe a CA program. So we can see here that we've got a booster, defender, anti-program attacker. Now with the program that I created earlier, if we come back to the items directory, similar to what we did just from the compendium is that we can now drag this as well. And we've also dragged the ASP program in. Now with the cyber deck, there's a few things that we need to do. Um, primarily, primarily we need to um, actually equip the cyber deck. So if we click here, we go from owned to equipped. This will actually bring up in our fight tab, both a meet section and a net section. And within the net section, we can actually see that we have our subadec functionality to actually make some checks with the subadec. The second thing that we want to do with the subadec is to install the programs. So where we were before, where it has this install button under the subadec, we'll click this one. It'll actually pick up the programs that we have within the character sheet. We can see here that it's got all four programs and we'll actually select all four that we want to install. Now these are installed and we'll actually see them listed here under the installed section both with our Black Ice programs, uh, Defender, Booster, and Anti-Program Attacker or Anti-Personnel Attacker. Now for Netrunners that want to make a just an, an example interface check, so they want to use essentially their interface ability, that's available under the Role tab. So we click Role, we can see here uh, we've got the Netrunner selected under the roles. We can actually just make a standard interface check. So this could be, for example, trying to jack into the net or something like that. Um, that isn't, you know, you know, um, sort of using any particular program. We can just click interface. We can click roll and that'll roll the character for us. So that's a 13 on their interface check. The next thing that a net runner will want to do is to perform net actions uh, that typically is done with their cyber deck. So what we'll do is we'll come back here to the fight tab make sure we're under the net section. And then we can see here that the cyber deck has a range of options that we can perform. So scanner, backdoor, cloak, control, uh, everything that's available in the core rule book. Additionally, there is just a generic defense and speed checks, which you will often make, uh, you know, when you're either defending or whether you're sort of initiating combat within the, the net run. Now uh, with those uh, there, what we can take a look at next is the programs. So programs are fairly straightforward. We can see that they're all listed here. Um, what we ultimately want to do is either res or de-res them to actually bring them into our sub deck to have them ready to go for when we enter a net run. So let's say that we want to load up our shield program, which we can see is listed here. If we hover over this, bo uh, this button, it says to click to activate program. 
we can do so here and that's now in our resed section here so we can see here we've got the shield which is set and we can see there's the uh, any applicable stats so attack defense or res ability and we can also do that for any other programs that we want to add in such as the sea booster and we also have the sword anti-program attacker which doesn't exactly get res but we can also make attacks with this as well so with this, if we take a look at the settings, we can see that it deals 3d6 res to black ice or 2d6 res damage to non-black ice programs. So that's great because it actually means when we're using the program in battle, we can actually make an attack directly from this screen and we can roll both the attack and roll the damage depending on what it's going to be. But I'll, I'll look into that a little bit later in a different section. So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, great, I've got programs, I've got them resed, but how do I actually see or navigate the, the net architecture. Uh, that's going to be a different item, which I'm going to bring up now. So we close out of our character sheet, go to the items directory. We can actually see that under create item, we have an option to create what's called a net architecture. Now I've, uh, I've already created one, which I've just called office net, which we'll take a look at now when I bring this one up. And we can see here uh, under the description, we've got a sort of a, like a table interface. And from here, I've actually got a variety of floors. So you can see here that there's a floors, which are one through seven, a DV check, which indicates the DV that needs to be met, the data, which indicates what it is. So, you know, file, password, a control node, or even a black ice program like an asp or a hellhound. And then we have the ability to modify where they are in terms of the flaws or even just modify the DV check if we want to modify the DV. Now, if we wanted to add additional flaws or if we wanted to potentially branch them out, so that there were different branches that you could take, you could click the plus button on the right hand side here to create a flaw. And that gives you the option here to continue creating your net architecture. Now it does have the ability to go quite far down. There's also an ability here that you can see under the A through to H that gives you the ability to branch. So you could have something on one A and then something on one B and that will actually branch them into two different sections. So once you have your ideal net architecture in mind, what you can do is click on the auto generate scene from data button, which is this one just down here. And what this will do is it'll automatically create a brand new scene within Foundry that's going to match the net architecture that you created on the tables. So you can see here that it's even created the items with the applicable uh, DV checks, what we can see here. So file DV is six, password DV eight, control node DV 10, and so on and so on. So this is great. So for uh, you that, you know, you wanted to be able to provide your net runner with a sort of a visual interface in terms of navigating the net, this just gives you that flexibility, but you know, by all means, feel free to do what's best with you and your party, just in case they maybe don't want a sort of a visual perspective. Now, in terms of bringing in a character, you could more than likely, and this is what I do with my party, is go to the actors directory, find the net runner character, and you can now also bring them into this scene as well. So what we could do is, let's say that we want to bring case down right to the start of the net, net architecture. We could come here to configure, and we could even just change the accessibility from GM only to all players. And what that would mean is that the case character or the person that has the permissions for case can actually see both the office and the office net, which I'll show you in just a moment. Okay, I've just switched to our player who is case, so you can see that they only have the ability to see their actor or you know their items that they have because of the permissions that we have set. We can actually see with what I've said earlier uh, that they have access to, let's say the meet space. So for this example, they're in this office building. And with what we've set, we've also set uh, that they can see the net architecture. Now, because this is an actor type for the player character, any changes to their stats will be affected between you know both of the scenes. So if they lose health within the net architecture, that'll also come across to their character as well. So let's just say, for example, minus two, they lose health from here, and they'll also have lost this health here as well. So this just gives you consistency between scenes as well, which is definitely great for when they're actually nav navigating the net architecture or whether they need to you know bring anything in. Uh, so if we come back to our player character here, we can see at, at the moment that they've got some vision set here, which is a, a little bit tricky. Um, but you can also, as a GM, change a few things around if you wanted to, just to uh, give them the flexibility for what they need. All right, so I'm back to the GM screen at the moment. Let's make a few tweaks to the scene just to get this working correctly, just to give the play character the, the best experience possible. What we'll do under the office net is we'll configure it. I've actually selected here the navigation. I, I didn't have this ticked early, but I've ticked this now just so the play character can access it. And what we want to do here is we want to not restrict the token vision at the moment. 
Um, we'll also disable fog exploration, and this will actually mean that the token will be able to, in theory, see the entire scene, but we'll actually do a few restrictions um, in a moment just to actually see how that looks. So with that set, let's take a look and see what the player character looks like again. Okay, I'm back to the player character view, and we can see that, in theory, the uh, Netrunner can now see the entire net architecture, which at the moment here is a straight line. So what we're probably thinking is, at the moment, if there's a password check, if the Netrunner needs to try and see uh, throughout the net architecture, they need to make the appropriate checks, but we don't want them to be able to see beyond a password until they actually crack the password. So what we'll do is let's switch back to our GM view, and we'll actually make a few changes just to potentially even hide that. So I'm back at the GM view now, and what we'll do is all of these items are actually tokens that are pre-generated into the scene. So what we can do, if we go over here to the tile controls, we can actually see here that we have Basically, we can select each item and we can actually choose to lock them or we can even potentially even just hide them, you know, toggle visibility state. So let's say that we want the Netrunner to jump in. They can immediately see a file in front of them in the first floor and then they can see a password, but they can't see anything further from that at the moment. What we could do is we could select multiple uh, tiles. What we could do is we could select this and then we could select toggle visibility state. And that's now essentially hidden the tiles from the player's view. If we wanted to be really technical, we could probably also go through with these little uh, arrows as well. Click hide, and then we can see that the entire net architecture beyond this initial password is now hidden to the net runner. So let's take a look and see what that looks like from the player side of things. They now only see up to the password, which is great. So that's exactly what we wanted for this situation. So they can see the file that they want to crack, the password, and then once they actually make it past the password, which, so let's just say that they move forward, we can then as a GM, switch back in and then we can potentially you know bring them up to the next pass so what we'll do is we'll make sure we're under tile controls again select these i'm just holding shift right click and then we'll unhide and then the uh then the net runner can actually see further into the net architecture and we can actually see that from the player view as well so then they can continue forward just like that now for the Netrunner, as they're navigating their way through the net, let's say that we take them back to the initial file that they looked at first. Uh, as they need to make applicable checks, such as ID or you know uh, control and everything like that, if we bring up the character sheet, we can see here under the fight uh, net tab that we looked at earlier that they can make the applicable checks on the left-hand side here, and that'll bring in their uh, interface as well as any ability bonuses that they may have from their programs. So we can see here if we wanted to make, say, an ID check just to see what we could find from the file. That'll bring up a confirmation just saying, hey, your interface is currently full, which is what it's said to. If there's any mods or boosters that are applicable for this check, we can also modify them here, but it should bring them in automatically and then click confirm. And then in this example, we can see that we rolled an ID of six which is actually be uh, has beaten that DB of six that we're after here. So, you know, in theory, we could have cracked that file and we have access to that file that we can now copy onto the cyber deck. Uh, same goes for passwords or control nodes as well. So again, as you navigate forwards through the net architecture, you can then click here and then go through the applicable checks and, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, the thing that will get interesting is when we get to black ice programs, which I'll get to in just a moment. So Black Ice is a little bit different uh, in terms of how we in, uh, sort of configure an interface. It's what I'll do is let's just re-enable the visibility on this remaining uh, content within the net architecture. And what we can do is let's just bring our net runner down to let's say the ASP. So as they navigate to, to the floor, which has an, uh, an ASP sort of line in weight, we'll bring them in. And we can say here as an example that they're now going to interact with an ASP um, program, you know, they're actually going to enter into combat with it. Because of what we've done earlier with the actors directory, we've actually created an ASP program. What we could easily do just as, as an example is to bring the ASP program in. Now I've done a few tweaks on my side just to make it sort of really easy in terms of configuring for gameplay. If we take a quick look under the prototype icon, I've actually set the uh, resources. I've set the stats.res to hold by owner, and that'll actually pull that in appropriately when we bring them down. So bring in the ASP program here, we'll drop them on this tile, and we can see here that both case and the ASP program, we can actually now see their health sort of uh, displayed just like this, which is really helpful for when we're actually entering into combat. We can then track or, or minus their res just from right-clicking and then minusing it uh, appropriately. 
So let's say, for example, that Case and the Asp are going to enter into combat. So when you encounter an enemy black ice line in wait within the architecture, according to the core rules, you're rolling your interface plus any speed bonus you have plus 1d10 versus the black ice's speed. So the easiest way to do that is to uh, for the play character to click on their character sheet, come down to the fight net tab, and there's going to be a speed option here, which is just going to... Again, unless you have any bonuses, it's just going to be your ability rank or your interface score, which we can roll as case. We can see here that they've rolled 12. And then we, as the GM, we can actually roll against them. So what I can do as the GM is I'll bring this screen up. We can see here that these are actually going to be clickable. What I'll do is I'll roll speed. So they have a speed of 6. So this will roll speed of 6 plus 1d10. And again, if we want to add or minus modifiers to the game for gameplay purposes, we can do that here. We'll click confirm. Oh, and we've also said that they've rolled 12 as well. Okay, great. So they're, they're basically tied on that. So let's say that we've moved down the initiative order and it's a Case's turn to make an attack against the ASP program. What we could do with Case is because he does have the sword program is we could make the attack from here just to process this. We could say with the sword program, so we can see here that it does 3d6 raise to black ice or 2d6 to non-black ice. It means that if, uh, if this does attack or if this does land the hit, it'll actually do 3d6 black ice damage, which is great. So that's exactly what we want to do in this situation. So what we'll do is we'll close out of this one. We'll actually make the attack. So we can see here that it has an attack score of one. It has an interface of four. Uh, and then we don't have any modifiers or boosters at this stage. So what we'll do is we'll click confirm. And this has rolled a total of 11. So an attack of one, interface of four, and that's given us 11 to attack. So likewise, from this other side of things, the black ice program is going to uh, defend itself. So what we'll do is we can bring up the ASP and we can even just roll its defense and see what it gets to see if it can beat the 11 that the sword program rolled. So similar to what we have here is that it'll roll its defense plus 1d10. We can see here that it has a stat value of 2. We'll roll this and that's got an 8. So that means that it hasn't beat it, which means that it is going to suffer the effect of the sword program, which is going to be 3d6. So what we'll do is as case, we'll bring this up again. We'll go here, and what we'll do is we'll click on the roll damage, and it'll actually prompt us. It says, is this damage to non-black ice or to black ice? So what we'll do is we'll say, this is a black ice program. We'll go confirm, and this is now rolled it for us, and that's now rolled five damage. So we can see here that that's five in total. And what I'll do just quickly here from my side is I'll just minus this. I'll just minus five. And we can see here that that's res's, uh, res has now been updated accordingly. We actually look at the character sheet. We can see it has now a res of 10 out of 15, just like that. So on the other side of things, because this ASP is an anti-personnel black ice program, they're going to make an attack directly against the netrunner themselves. So what we could do here is if we bring up the ASP, we can see here they have an attack of value. We can click here to roll this stat. We can see here that they have a stat value of 2 and then roll. And we can see that they've rolled an 8 here for their attack, which has uh, uh, their plus 2. Well, their 2 plus a 6 to get a total of 8. Uh, as a defender at this check, what we can do here if we wanted to is we could click defense here on the left-hand side. We can see here that, again, it's using our interface of 4. Click to roll. And we've now rolled 10, which has actually beat that, which means that we haven't taken the effect. So we won't be affected by the ASPs. Uh, program, which is to destroy a single program on the enemy netrunner cyberdeck, which is uh, which is great. So thankfully, we haven't been uh, we haven't been targeted from that one. So let's say as an example that the ASP has been defeated, but the netrunner actually has their own uh, program or their own copy of the ASP program that they actually want to bring into the net architecture or to res the program. Uh, now, with Foundry's permissions in terms of how we can do this, it gets a little bit tricky. So I'll just show you an example. Uh, as the GM, what we can do here from the GM screen is as case. We as a GM can bring this down and activate the ASP program just here. And that'll actually bring an actor in. So I'll just show you how this looks from here. We can actually see as the player character that they're actually lacking permissions. This is a Foundry thing, uh, which we haven't really been able to work around at the moment. You can actually see that there's no actor that's been generated. Um, but it does say that the, the program has been activated here. What I'll do is I'll just deactivate this one. We'll switch back to the GM view, which I'll just do now. So this is us as the game master. What I'll do is I'll click here on the character and we can actually see as the GM, if I actually activate this program here, this will actually bring this up here. And what it'll do is also create a actor token based on the token that we have as an actor. It'll actually bring them into the net architecture for us here. Um, and then from here, we can see their abilities and, and whatnot, and we can actually push them through the rest of the net architecture. Now, if you actually set the permissions correctly on here for the 
uh, permissions here. So for this, I've set the player to an owner. If we switch back to the player view and close out of this one, they should actually now be able to move the program by themselves. So here as the player, I can actually move this uh, backwards and forwards throughout the net and I'm actually sending the Black Ice program through the net architecture um, you know, as required, or I can actually make the checks for them, you know, just in case I want to be able to use that black ice accordingly. The only other real alternative at the moment, at least until Foundry has some more, you know, more elegant uh, permissions, is to give the player the ability to actually create their own actors or that create their own items. But again, that's that's a sort of a very open-ended thing. It would give them the ability to create quite a lot of things. So for the time being, if you do want to go down this path, is to uh, essentially. Uh, you know, activate the program yourself or as another alternative as the game master, which I'll just switch back to now. Uh, as the game master, if we just essentially just drop in a copy of the actor here, just like this, this also gives us an example of uh, just quickly, you know, bringing in the character as well. So a few different ways that you can do this, but that's just something to think about as you're navigating through the, uh, the net architecture. So there has been feedback from some people in terms of not wanting to use the net architecture, which is fine, you know, your game, your choice. Uh, what you could do as an alternative, just, you know, just in case you wanted to keep everything within the same scene, might make it easy for you in terms of tracking gameplay or tracking combat, is say that we went back to our actual meet space. So for example, we're back into this office building that we have here. If I went to uh, configure, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to increase the padding a little bit. So let's say, let's go a little bit over to point, uh, point 0.25, let's say point 0.3. What this will do is add some padding around the scene just in the background here so we actually can see that we have some room to work with. And what you could do, uh, you know, again, this is your preference, but you could actually add in the tokens or the tiles basically in the corner here and you can actually run a net architecture essentially within the same scene. Again, this is something you can do uh, as your choice, but you can actually see here, if we go to the system sub punk red core section, we're actually going to have a collection of items here as well. So what we'll do is we'll just come back here uh, and from here, we actually can select the tiles, net architecture. You have an option of PNG or WebM. And we can actually see here that you can drag them, uh, drag and drop them, and they'll actually allow you to build your own net architecture or even use your own. So what we can do here is let's say that we want to drop in an arrow. That's going to be a bit too large probably because I've set my asset grid a little bit too crazy. Let's try something a little bit more. Let's see what 140 looks like. That looks a little bit better. Um, we can actually come to here we can actually build our own net architecture so let's say that we have a file uh db of six and it looks good and just for example we'll just drop a few things in password and whatnot a again this just gives you the flexibility to create your own net architecture within a scene you're able to use these tiles however you like and you can create it uh, accordingly so there are a few final things i did want to touch on in terms of uh, other improvements or changes that you can make so as an example, I just wanted to show you what you could see with animated uh, scenes or animated um, net architectures. So this isn't ideal for situations where you have a lot of users that maybe don't have the best bandwidth or the best you know, computers because it can be a little bit more CPU intensive. What we could do is if we delete this uh, office net architecture, we'll come back to the item that we had earlier, the office net architecture. We could see here under customized scene generation that it gives us the ability to animate and we'll click confirm. And what this will do is it'll actually bring in the scene. It'll actually have animated tiles. So this is great. So this is thanks to uh, Solution Maps who's actually provided us the uh, tokens they're able to use for this. Um, but this is a little you know, nicer in terms of sort of graphical perspective if you wanted to go down that path. But again, keep in mind, it can be a little bit more CPU intensive for those of you that maybe want to keep that in mind or you know, you have users that aren't on the best internet connection. I'll even tell you here under the um, parentheses that this is animated. Uh, you can also see here that if you wanted to bring in your own tokens, that it does give you the ability to set the item folder path, the file extension path, uh, as well as if you wanted to change the tile widths or anything like that, or the connectors, just in case you wanted to have the flexibility to change it yourself or you did want them to be as large, just gives you lots of um, bits and pieces that you can work with. The very last thing I wanted to show you today was from one of our most recent updates, we have what we call item upgrades. So that it gives you the ability to add upgrades to an already existing item. So this is useful for a cyber deck for say physical hardware upgrades. So what we'll do is with our case character, we have their cyber deck, but let's say that we wanted to add maybe like a backup drive or a crash barrier, which is available from the core rulebook. What we'll do is we'll go to the item upgrades section here in the companion packs. We'll open this one up. We can see here that we have a backup drive. Let's say that we also want the crash barrier. 
and we can see here that they're under the item upgrade option. For all of our item upgrades, what we have here is the option to manage the upgrades. And what we'll do is we'll click on this one. It'll pick up the applicable item upgrades that are actually useful for the cyberdeck. We'll click on these. And what that'll do is it'll actually uh, show us here that this is now available. And we can uh, see that that's now ready to go as well. So it sort of gives us the little magnet that just tells us here. So we can bring this one up. We can see the settings and we can actually see, <laughs> oh, there you go. So that's quite funny. So each item upgrade is actually using two. So we have two, four. And then with all the programs we have, we're actually using over the amount of slots that we have. So for this program, we have seven slots. What I'll actually do is I'll remove a program just so we actually bring that up. So we're actually now back to the seven that we want here as well. So two and two, and then we have the applicable programs that we have. So that actually uses the functionality of telling you how many slots that you have available, just to make sure you're not going over your, uh, over your quota. Now, if you were uh, a little bit unsure on anything that I need to cover in this video, we do try to provide links back to our uh, GitLab wiki, which has a bit more information. So if you're ever curious about Cyberdeck items or programs, do feel free to click on this little help article item here that's uh, under most of the item types. So you have the Cyberdeck item or the program item. That'll take you back to your GitLab wiki help page, and that'll actually have a bit more information just in case you wanted to have a bit more of a, a further read through of everything that we uh, have implemented for the system or you know, a couple of sort of examples of how to uh, how to run things. Okay, that'll just about do it for this video. I do hope that that's helped explain a few things on how net running and net runners operate within the Cyberpunk Red Core system for Foundry Virtual Tabletop. If you have any feedback, comments, or your recommendations for future videos, please feel free to let me know. Uh, and again, this is a community project, so we're not uh, affiliated with Art or Sorry Games. We'd definitely love for you to join the community, both uh, on GitLab and Discord. I'll provide the links in the description below.